Hi, I'm Sandra McGregor, and I'm going to speak to you briefly about camellias. Um, they are a member of the tea family, and they have beautiful, it's a, they're a beautiful evergreen with beautiful flowers that appear in late fall and in winter. Um, if you like tea, you are drinking a camellia plant. Um, one of them, the senesis, is actually makes tea and then it's flavored and processed some other, other way. Next slide, slide please. <clears throat> so why would, why would you plant this plant? Um, one, you have these absolutely beautiful flowers. The flowers range from white to pink to blue. They have different sizes. You have singles, you have doubles, you have variegated ones. Um, the one on the upper right is what new breeder or breeders are coming up with the new plants. They're really becoming quite amazing. There are many uses for these plants. You could use them for screening, foundation, hedges, a specimen plant. You can also put them on the patio. You could grow more um, tropical ones and you could keep them on your patio. And if they don't, or in your Florida room, and if it doesn't go really below 40 degrees, you could keep them going year round. Um, next slide, please. Okay, in Northern Virginia, we have two primary varieties, um, Camellia japonica and Camellia sasanqua. Um, Camellia japonica is probably the hardier of the, of the varieties and more common. It blooms in winter, so starting in January and it goes until April. And it's really cold tolerant and it has large showy flowers. I've seen a lot of these this spring in, in, my, in the neighborhood around here. Camellia sasanqua is, um, it's, has a, is slightly fragrant. It's kind of an earthy scent to it. Um, I didn't read that it was described as pleasant, but it was not unpleasant. And it blooms starting in late October until January. And the picture there um, behind, underneath is from flat, fast growing trees and that's Yuletide because it tends to bloom around Christmas time. And it has a nice, it, um, it's, the flower isn't quite as nice as on the Japonica, but they're pretty nice at an ideal time for um, flowers. It's hard to tell the difference between these um, two, two species. Um, I think the leaves on the Jap Japonica are slightly bigger than the um, Sasanqua, but you really have to figure out what kind you have by when they're blooming. And different um, cultivars will bloom slight at slightly different times through the season. Um, let's see, next slide. <clears throat> so where do you plant? How do you care for it? I bought one and I killed it. I killed it very, very quickly, unfortunately. And I did some things wrong. So this is, wish I had done this before I had planted it. It likes acidic soil. 5.8 to 6.5, likes organic soil, it likes well-drained soil. You know, if you have azaleas or rhododendrons that are doing well, that would be kind of an area that would go along with um, <clears throat> camellias. It likes to not be in full sun. It likes after afternoon shade in warmer climates. It likes protection from the wind. Um, in, if it doesn't have wind protection in winter, you could give it a little more water to keep it from desiccating, the, the leaves from desiccating. It's a very shallow rooted plant like azaleas are. And so when you plant it, you need to mulch it after planting, but you should also dig, um, instead of digging the pot, maybe just twice the size of the plant, of the planter that you're gonna put, dig it three times the size so it has lots of room to grow. And be sure to do supplemental watering since it is a shallow plant, make sure you, you monitor it that it doesn't have wet feet because it will catch a, it could die because of wet feet. But um, just make sure that it's not drying out. Um, so kind of basic pruning for these, you want it nice and kind of open so that air can flow, flow through pretty easily. Fertilizing, it's not a one and done. <clears throat> you should plan on fertilizing uh, through the season, through the growing season. So starting early in spring, again in late spring, and then the latest feeding in July. Don't 
um, fertilize after July because you're going to have some, you'll force out some new growth of leaves and they won't be able to harden off in time for winter. So I, I have raking down and that is basically hygiene. A great way to keep all of your camellias happy and healthy is to clean up debris from underneath it. If you have any kind of funguses, <clears throat> um, they could drop on the ground and then be um, spread through to other plants, to other camellias, or even more on your own plant. Um, so if you rake and you mulch, uh, put new mulch down, then um, you should have a nice healthy plant. Next slide. Oh. So there, there are problems with, <laughs> with um, camellias. And it, there's a list here. Camellia dieback, camellia flower blight, leaf spot, anthracnose, petal blight, scale. Um, those can be really bad. There's a picture of flower blight there. It looks horrible. <laughs> but some of these can be treated with hygiene, cleaning up the foliage. Um, there, if something else gets, um, if you get galls, if you clean up if any sign of illness or infection, if you clean it up and remove the material, it should be good. So hygiene is important. Um, Nancy is going to talk to you about scale. Yeah. If you go to fairfaxgardening.org forward slash camellias, there's an excellent history and it's actually pretty interesting about who the plant was named for and how it came to be imported. And uh, the other thing I wanted to bring up is that it's important to remember not to crowd a camellia because it's got that shallow root system and it can't compete with things like oaks and elms big trees. So you might want to think about that when you're planting. And I wanted to mention that some of the later on you're going to hear about native alternatives for camellias, but I'd like to recommend some companion planting for camellias. Remember what they need. They need partial shade, they need even moisture. So things like rhododendrons and azaleas, hellebores, ferns, and spring flowering bulbs are all good things that to grow around your camellia that won't crowd the roots and will share their culture. This picture shows you the green and the light green, shows you how camellias are spread across the United States. It's not a native plant, but it is also not invasive. Virginia Tech has done a study and says it stays in your garden. So it's a good thing to grow. I'm gonna to talk to you now. Um, next slide. Oh, <laughs> these are some pictures. The bloom can vary. This is just one of the common ones that um, a neighbor has a, a Sasanqua that's as tall as their house. It's sheltered on, it's on their east side. So it's sheltered from the north wind and it's huge. It also has a, a small fruit. It's about a half inch to an inch long. It looks brown and weathery like that and inside are some nuts. And the people of Jap in Japan use those nuts. They express the oil from them and use them from all kinds of things industrial as well as home cooking. You can see a bud there and there's an example of the bark when the tree gets mature. My, my bush is maybe seven years old and it doesn't have anything like a trunk like that. So next slide. You can see that it doesn't really take a lot of pruning. You just kind of want to trim back any branches. They're getting really leggy and anything branches crossing, it's standard pruning. Do it right after it blooms so that you don't lose any flowers from the next year. And they really do fall off and look like that around the plant. Next slide, please. Those are just all the resources. Okay, let's move on to Camellia cottony scale, Pulvinaria fluxifera. 
Next slide, please. Scales are small. They're almost immobile. You can't see their legs or their antenna. They resemble fish scales when they're pressed tightly against the plant. They have long thread-like mouth parts called stylets that are six to eight times longer than the scales themselves. There are over 150 different kinds of scales native to Virginia. Many are common and serious pests of trees, shrubs, and indoor plants. If you look closely, the little brown splotches that are kind of circular on that uh, dark green leaf on the top left, those are the scales, okay? All right, let's have the next slide. You should check your camellia every spring after flowering. And believe me, after writing this, I did go out and check my camellia, uh, especially if it appears unhealthy or if you haven't had much new growth. These plants are very slow growing, so it takes them a while to get established. So that shouldn't be a worry, but once they're established, if you see that you're not getting any growth, it's time to check. You're looking for yellowing on the leaves or the leaves dropping off. If you see that, turn them over and check the underside. If you've got cottony scale, there will be small white masses. And this leaf, the underside of this leaf, you can sort of see the yellowing areas coming through from the top of the leaf underneath. But this black sooty stuff is from, is from the honeydew or sweet sap that these scales secrete and then black powdery mildew grows on top of it. If the scale damage goes undetected for long periods, it will seriously weaken or kill the infected portions. The problem with cotton camellia scale is that it doesn't affect just camellias. It also affects English ivy, euonymus, hydrangea, maples, mulberries, pittosporums, rhododendrons, and yews. Although they uh, reduce plant vigor, they do not usually kill the plant. The main problem they cause is the large amounts of honeydew produced, which covers the leaves and acts as a growth medium for the black sooty mold. The honeydew also attracts ants, flies, wasps, etc., that can become an, a nuisance. Next slide, please. I know this is sort of disgusting, but Soft cottony scales range from a twelfth of an inch, the very tiny ones that are right around the central vein of this leaf, to a quarter of an inch long. There are two types of scales that attack camellias. Today we're just talking about soft scales. If you scrape the scale with your fingernail and it comes off, that's a soft scale because that waxy secretion is part of its body. If you scrape it, and the covering comes off, then that's a hard or armored scale. In general, soft scales are larger and more con convex than armored scales. It is important to identify the type of scale so that you treat it appropriately. Cottony scale females lay between 100 to 1,000 eggs in ovisacs, and those are those white cottony masses that you can see there. Those are all scales laying their eggs. They hatch according to the University of Maryland pest predictive calendar, in case you need one. These eggs will hatch around the time of full bloom of the smoke bush, which is generally early June. I don't know in this season that everything seems a little off. The crawlers can move about on the tree or the plant for a few days to several weeks, they're looking for the best part to eat. They develop slowly and it may be several months to a year before the females become adults. There's one generation this, each year in this area. Overwintering as un immature fertilized females, they resume feeding in the spring, mature and lay eggs. 
Once they've laid the eggs, the female dies, dries up, and falls to the ground. The best way to prevent infestations is to space camellias for sufficient air circulation and to prune their interior to keep their structure open. Your first control tool is proper culture so the plant is not stressed. Keep trees and shrubs watered during dry spells. And the University of Maryland uh, recommends not over fertilizing in this area because of our clay soil. Um, the Arboretum there recommends once after flowering with holly tone. Again, it depends on the type of soil. To control an infestation, remove any of the cottony egg masses found on leaves. If it's a minor infestation, handpick the scales by scraping them off and discarding. If it's just on a few leaves, pull those leaves and discard them. If it's more heavily infested, then you can cut off the branches and destroy them. The best control option for a truly horrible infestation is horticultural oil sprayed during the dormant season to prevent overwintering. In Virginia, crawlers are usually active June 1st through 10th. If necessary, you can treat with an insecticide for crawlers between June 10th and 20th. Spraying an insecticidal soap later during the growing season will help control crawlers as well as adults. Make sure you spray two applications 10 days apart. Next slide, please. Please do not use broad spectrum insecticides, which may kill the natural enemies of scales. And there's quite a few natural enemies that will destroy the scales. I highly recommend that if you're concerned about the health of your camellia, there's a YouTube video made by the University of Maryland where uh, the uh, Dr. I can't remember her name, um, shows you a heavily infested plant and she's laughing at it. And she says, you know, this has clearly been there for years. So it'll make you feel better. <laughs> Are there any questions? She uh, somewhat answered Nancy, uh, uh, how quickly did the plants grow, do camellias grow? I've ha had mine about seven years and it's about six feet high. It was a quart container plant when I bought it and it was really very slow to establish itself. I have it growing at the edge of a woodland. It gets morning sun only and it's got a big holly on the north side to protect it from uh, winter winds. But other than that, there's nothing, a few hostas and bulbs and things, there's nothing really vying for its root system. So I think it does grow slowly because of the leaf cover and the soil has never been um, farmed before. I haven't bothered with uh, fertilizing. I may start that this year with uh, some holly tone because I've got a bunch of azaleas that probably could use it too. But the, the tree on the left or the bush on the left, it's a sasanqua that my neighbor has. I can tell because it starts blooming in early or late fall, very early winter. And mine is a japonica because it doesn't start blooming. It bloomed from February through March this year. So it's later. Its color is more vivid than the other one, but boy, what a specimen. If you want the address, I'll have you drive by and look at it. <laughs> it's, it's amazing. What, one other question is, is uh, specifically about specimen plants versus groupings. Do you have any recommendations on that? I think the best, if you're, if you're curious, I think the best thing to do, the University of Maryland has an arboretum where they have a whole section that's just camellias. And I think that's probably the best place to go see what they look like. 
There are so many new varieties. There are even some, I understand some dwarf varieties out there now, which would be really cool nestled in with, you know, azaleas and if you could get the colors to, to match up. I see far more hoponicas, japonicas in this area than I do sasanquas. And I don't know if that's just because that's what nurseries have been offering or if it's truly an improvement over the sasanqua. I know farther south, they grow a lot of the sasanquas 